Welcome to episode 361 of the KISS FAQ podcast. We are live, I think. Let's find out. (laughs) Testing, testing, testing. (laughs) Yeah, we are... We are indeed live, so thank you everyone who's uh, tuning in to join us live today as we uh, do our roundtable or uh, cesspool discussion about the Kistory documentary, a two-night event. Before we get to that, I do want to just mention uh, for members of the board, did get copies of Ken Sharp's physical seven-inch single, got an exclusive color just for the FAQ. Uh, in white vinyl, 60 gram vinyl, re- very cool. His uh, covers of Mr. Make Believe and Hold Me, Touch Me, which are very well done. I've only got 10 copies and that's it. So uh, look out for a post on those coming and I'll be figuring out international postage for people in Canada and whatnot uh, soon enough. Yeah. So, so so that's it on, on the side of uh, non-history conversation. Let's jump straight into history which aired this past sunday and monday nights in the u.s i think a lot of international people have have been able to view the documentary now uh through various means and i've seen it circulating all over the place in various forums of course and you know let's just start with uh you can you know your overall impressions about the documentary okay well (laughs) It was it was well done. I mean, it was well done. Um, uh, I you know they definitely were missing you know comments from other uh, former members. You know, newer comments. You know, like Peter and Ace, of course. Um, everything was pretty good. It was well produced and, and so on. Um, but I, I think it's it wasn't really made for. Um, Kiss fans, in general, or let me put, let me let me, let me do that. Uh, casual Kiss fans, or or you know, non Kiss fans. So those those are the fans that it was made for the casual Kiss fans, and maybe a non Kiss fan or someone that just doesn't know a whole, whole bunch about them. It's not for the diehard Kiss fan. It's it was you know that's how I look at it. It's really not, was not made for the diehard fan. Um, and we'll, we'll get into other stuff. But I thought, I mean, it was well done. That's good. But it's there's a lot of pieces of the puzzle missing as far as a documentary, a, a definitive documentary. Nice. Well, Mark, since you're banging down the door to get in, uh, you know, what we, what were your thoughts on, on the documentary overall? And I'm, you know, we've got a little skeleton of questions that we're going to go around um, talking with each one of the participants on uh, do chime in with your comments. We'll flash some of them up on the screen as we go along and don't be afraid to call us out and say, Hey, what about this? Or you're wrong on that. This is a conversation. If you're there watching, you got every right to uh, have something to say so uh uh mark yeah really bob <laughs> well i mean you know how i feel it's not it's not a big surprise is it i mean uh but as far as the the uh documentary goes i i was actually kind of pleasantly surprised to be honest um you know i i was expecting it to be a little bit more of a snoozer than it actually was because i thought you know it's gonna be oh i already know all this stuff blah 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 <laughs> but a lot of it was uh, was very captivating I found I found a lot of the footage and because I'm not a big collector of video like maybe like someone like Andrew might have seen some of this stuff a hundred thousand times hello Andrew by the way uh, and uh, maybe he's seen some of this stuff but I'm not a big video collector hey David and uh, so for me it was really exciting some of this stuff I, I thought that it was very well done uh, of course you know some of the comments towards Peter and Ace were what you probably expected uh, and you know so, some of and some of their memory of how it was done uh, or how they started was a little interesting. Considering that if you guys listened to three sides uh, last week, how they were talking, uh, they, they had the, the old uh, Sean Delaney interview there, and how he was bitching about they they never gave him credit about him actually helping them out with the moves and all this stuff, and how Paul and Gene always seem to take credit for all this stuff and forget about him. Well, I didn't hear much mention of Sean in that 
did you? I mean, not not a lot, right? And he was pretty integral to it, I think. So there's another misstep. I'm sure Paul and them knew all about that. But overall, I think it was good. I think it was well done, especially if you're a you know Johnny Come Lately fan or somebody who just got gotten to it now. You know, it's very informative. And I, and I thought it was it was well done. You know, they, they went over the 80s a little bit more than I actually thought they would, which is surprising. So I thought that they would have really just went over to that and just went right over to Tommy and those guys. But, you know, it, it was it was pretty good. I mean, you know, could it have been better? Yeah. Could it have been uh, more informative on certain aspects of it? Yeah. But then it would have to be like six hours, not four hours, right? Yeah, well, it always should have been. And uh, by the way, since I've got everyone who did the show while I was off in uh, Boston and New England on the show today, great job, guys. I enjoyed listening to it. So thank you very much for giving me some entertainment during. Don't worry about it. It, it, was, a, it was a really long drive yeah, up, to, up to Vermont. <laughs> so, uh, Lonnie, what were your overall impressions of history? Well, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it more, actually, than I thought I would. I, I went into it kind of with an attitude of, well, it's really going to be an ace and peter um bashing session and it it really wasn't um as much as i thought it was going to be i i think they they kept the high road on a lot of that stuff and didn't go down um into really bad mouthing them yeah at times especially during night one it felt like well it's gene and paul's band and peter and ace were just kind of along for the ride it kind of made it sound like in that in night one more so than anything and I was more okay with that being the the story they were trying to convey than the just constant belittling and bashing them the whole time, which I really thought was what we were going to get. And and it wasn't, you know. Yeah, there were some jabs taken, and well, at, at Ace and at Peter, especially at the end with the Tom Snyder interview. But it it really they really didn't just constantly bash them like I thought they would. Was it geared toward the casual fan? Absolutely. It was geared, it was it was filmed for the casual fan. Guys like us and guys watching this, we already know the story. But it was very well done in that it kept your interest the whole time and, and kept you engaged in watching it throughout both nights. And I too was impressed with how much love they gave the 80s. I thought that they would take off the makeup in 83 and then bam it was 1995 and we're doing MTV unplugged. I, I really thought that. And there were some parts in the 80s that I thought could have been more explored than others, like Gene going Hollywood and, and things of that nature. They kind of glossed over that a little bit. They did go in, they did go into it, but I thought they could have maybe dug a little bit deeper how much Paul Stanley was really um, carrying the torch and plowing forward in the 80s and how responsible he was for that. But but I thought it was very well done. I thought the I thought that the end could have been a little bit better because they, like I said, they, I thought it would go from 83 to 95 in a flash. Well, it really went from 2003, 2004 to 2019 in a flash. Um, yeah. there, there was nothing about, hey, you know, then we're so comfortable with this new lineup that why not do an album? Why not do another album? But they never went into any of that. And I, and I get it. Well, there, there's no drama in that. Like there was drama and everything else leading up to that. But and overall, I thought it was very well done. It and you know it probably is a, the definitive Kiss documentary. And they All also right. skipped over uh, Peter returning back for Symphony. They just yeah, talked I know, about I Tommy, that was, and they didn't talk about that. Revision yeah, right there. Yeah, yeah. That that was uh, a bit disappointing, but also that they didn't linger on post two thousand and you know three. Basically, was a bit of a blessing to be perfectly honest. Daniel, your overall impressions. Well, you guys covered most of it, but uh, I have to say I was pleasantly surprised. Um, but imagine if they bashed Peter and Ace, of course, a bit. But I, when I when I watched it, I, I was thinking, uh, imagine if Peter and Ace had the work rate of Gene and Paul and the same attitude. It would be the most boring documentary ever. You know, you need the Gene and Jang. You need. Ace and Peter in order to make it interesting because we've all seen the backstage footage from the hits tour when Peter and Ace were, were no longer in the band and there's really nothing going on. It's a bit goofy but not much drama if you don't count uh, Eric Carr's, uh, you know, wanting to be a bigger part of the show. 
So I, I, I felt it was a good documentary. Uh, there were some new facts that I didn't know, and it was a good balance between uh, the different eras. I was thinking they would be pushing the uh, end of the road tour and mm -hmm. the, the, the current lineup much more than they did. So I was pleasantly surprised about that. And as you mentioned, the non-makeup era got uh, uh, was covered quite a bit. And I especially enjoyed that little snippet from Tokyo 95, which is uh, one of my absolute favorite shows ever. And it was almost in mint condition. It was just five seconds, but uh, it made me go, wow, you know, like you did back in the day when you were 15, 16 years old. So I, I liked the documentary. You know, can I just say one thing really quickly? Yeah. Um, you talk about how they needed Ace and Peter to make it exciting. Now, I understand from a viewer's perspective that that's probably 100% true. But being in a band before, and I'm sure Andrew can support this theory as yeah, well. Of course, I, of course. I think that having no drama was probably great for them at that time. Because could you imagine if they had that kind of drama for the next you know, 20 years or whatever? It would drive them absolutely insane. So yes, as a viewer... We were hoping for more craziness behind the scenes, but I'm sure Paul and Gene were more than happy to not have that in their lives at that time. Yeah, of course, Mark. Uh, I understand. I've also been played in band uh, bands, yeah. but uh, but but um, it would be boring, <laughs> uh, and I, I don't think they would be as successful if they had four guys who were all about working hard and and uh, not so much rock and roll. You need some mm. diversity in the band. There's always at least one. There's always. Yeah. All right, Andrew, you're 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 up. I made you wait until last deliberately because I knew you'd probably speak the longest. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, well, I'm, I'm going to echo everybody's statements about the uh, about the documentary. But I, I, I'm sorry, Ken. I didn't I didn't hear yours, and, and Julian, I, I didn't hear yours either. But nobody mentioned the cheesy uh, the, uh, the the cheesy music, music beds. Yeah. Like, why, oh, yeah. like it, it was it was the best kiss documentary with no kiss music. So and I, I thought it was funny that the same songs and the same parts were kind of um, they were kind of repeated. Like they played shout out loud a couple times and rock and roll a, a couple times more than a couple. You know, so I thought it was funny that oh, we're, we're going to license these three songs. And every time we play a song, it's going to be those three songs. <laughs> I also uh, I, I enjoyed part two more than I enjoyed part one. Um mainly because when part one started, it almost looked exactly like one last time. And when I was at the premiere in Tribeca, I almost stood up and I was like, I, I it was, that was going to be my last moment as a Kiss fan if that actually happened that way. And it was one last time. It wasn't, but thank, thank God it wasn't. Cause it was, but, but there were some really cool things about it, especially in part one. I really, really enjoyed uh, the footage of Peter from 1967 yeah, and hold really, that because we're we're going to talk about favorite bits and pieces. You know? Yeah, but I mean, but like overall, it again was not made for us. It was made as a advertisement for the end of the road. I mean, I see people walking away from this, going, you know what? We should see them one more time, and by design, by design. So overall, I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, if this if this documentary had a theme song, it would be "I Was Made for Loving Me." Um, not you. <laughs> <laughs> but how many times, like I, I've read so many threads about about the documentary, and people mention Paul's ear, and they're like, "Man, I had no idea. I didn't know so much about Paul's ear and Paul's feet." I'm like, Paul's what? hairline. <laughs> Paul's hairline was a big thing as well. Well, yeah, it's it's a big, the unblended foundation, because that that's just studio makeup, no big deal. It just wasn't blended well at the hairline, mm -hmm. which or or the formerly the act known as the hairline, whatever the case may be, mm -hmm. says the guy wearing the hat. Um, so, Andrew, you and I are in a, a similar situation in one one case, and I haven't given my opinion, and it's coming now. And I want to preface it by you went to Tribeca and yeah. saw part one the uh, screen there, and mm -hmm. it was a different cut to the version yeah, that was broadcast. It so I saw the screener as well, and to be perfectly honest, it skewed my opinion of it when I actually uh, watched the air version uh, for a couple of reasons. Things were taken out that were in the screener for whatever reason, time limitations or last minute. Holy shit, we can't put that in there. The Kiss fans' heads are going to explode if we say that. Um, there was one Gene comment that, that I remember off the top of my head that was taken out. Thank goodness. Um, and then there was a long, and it's starting to circulate now, so uh, I will mention it. It is Paul Stanley calling um, or as, uh, associating Peter Chris's 
de declination to allow Beth to be used in the documentary as the behavior of a petulant child. And then he has this long ice cream analogy, um, which I thought was absolutely unnecessary. Um, not necessarily unwarranted because there's two perspectives to that, but I don't think it needed to be included in there. And I was really thrilled when the air version did come out that it was not there, but having already heard it, it did obviously give me a bit of a downer about the whole thing. Overall, um, I'm mixed on it. You know, I love the footage. I kind of like the narrative flow of the overall story and the two parts. I preferred part two. I, I think within the limitations of the victors write the history, um, it's no different than the 27 documentaries that have come before. And it was nice that Gene took some um, acknowledgement of his own failings in the 70s, but it seemed to be a continuous, you know, where where the reason why this band is here. Yeah, you are. You are still here. <laughs> You're an gone. So it, it, it got a little bit tiresome, the, what I perceived as a continuous uh, denigration of their contributions, because it did take those four original ingredients to make a great band that we're having a documentary about. Otherwise, they wouldn't have skipped over 2003 to 2021 um, or some other errors. But I was glad that they included Mark St. John. I'm glad mm -hmm. they included Vinny. I'm glad they included uh, Eric Carr. So overall, I'd give it a... a B minus or C plus, mm -hmm. uh, if I was to give it a grade, um, it was wow. two. It was two nights of Kiss on TV, and it had lots of footage that I enjoyed. So overall, I was very happy to see a lot of that footage, and for there to be two nights of television. So, you know, that, that's kind of it. it it's plus and minus. It, again, it depends where you're coming from. Um, you know, your personal taste of what you think. So, you know, chime in with your comments um, in the chat thread, because we do want to read what you were thinking about it as well. So let's move up. Did it live up to the hype? And this is well, a quick, if I could yes, just, no. If I could just add a quick little little comment <laughs> to yours. It was almost like the, the version that I saw in Tribeca and the screener that you saw was almost like a work print version. It was a lot more rough around the edges than what ended up airing ultimately. And I will tell you this, that after watching it without commercials and then with commercials, the commercials really sour the experience. They really, oh, really shit, do. yeah. They I really, could really not stop. Five minutes of commercials every eight minutes or eight yeah. to ten minutes, yeah, it was, which is absolutely brutal. And I know now that Expedia, damn it, we're not canceling the holiday, you know, from all those freaking commercials that just, or was it Kayak, whatever it was. Whatever you know. it was. I mean, yeah. here's the thing too, like you can purchase this on Amazon and you can purchase it also on iTunes. As, and I believe iTunes is the highest quality version that you can purchase. Um, I highly recommend doing that just if you haven't seen it. Um, and you're right. I don't think they mentioned Bob Kulik at all. They mentioned a little bit. Bruce did. Just I think he just said his brother. I don't think he ever said Bob Kulik. But they certainly didn't mention anything about Alive 2 because they skipped over that as far as narrative goes. Um, yeah, so but, so let, let's get into yeah. that question about did it live up to the hype? Because this has been a long time coming. And just going back to that work print, they did have at least the titles right in that work print, the screener, yeah. that were then wrong. Uh, you know, Muddy Waters and the New York Dolls under the Kiss picture, you know, stuff like that. Little tweaks. So that shit happens in production. Lonnie, live up to the hype? Yes, no. I think it lived up to the hype. Um, the hype that there was for it anyway, you know, the hype, the hype amongst Kiss fans anyway. I, I think it lived up to it. You know, it it, it was a it was, it was a good story from start to finish. So I I think yes, it lived up to it. I don't I don't think it didn't live up to the hype. Do I have some some things I didn't like about it? Sure. Do I have some things that I really like about it? Yeah, absolutely I do. But I think I think it lived up to the hype. Maybe maybe not people's expectations or maybe not people's um, story part part of the story they wanted told, but as far as the hype, yeah, absolutely. Mark, what about you? Um, I guess I would say, yeah. And by saying yes, I'm gonna say this too that I've already kind of learned my lesson as far as like expecting too much from Chris Kiss stuff. So the hype that they'd made for it, I thought was equal to what I got. Um, you know, I think sometimes maybe it's just me. Maybe you guys will answer this in your own answers. But I think sometimes when I expect something from Kiss before, I used to get overly 
expecting like a lot of you know new stuff and a lot of something that's going to come out of the woodwork like oh my god i've never like i'm already kind of past that point now with kiss i'm kind of just learning to be happy with what i get and you know we got we did get some cool footage like i i really dug the part where he was playing his guitar where he pulled out the smashed mirror guitar and was talking about it and kind of showed it they're like i'm you know i'm a gear sucker so of course when they do that kind of stuff i was all over it or when they went into the studio and showed studio shots you know you could have dropped a you know a quarter on my head and i probably wouldn't even notice i was so zoomed in on it you know so those things i think they did good you know i i don't really now expect a lot from kiss that i know it's sounding like i'm kind of digging at them but i don't expect to be overly wowed now because i've i've already been disappointed too many times in that way but overall i thought the hype was equal to what i got daniel uh yeah uh i think they managed to put a few easter eggs and surprises in in the movie uh, that i didn't expect uh, and that's pretty spectacular at this point of time you know they've released almost everything they can but they dug deep and managed to find a few uh, nuggets that uh, the diehards um, got a kick out of so uh, i think that was a great thing and uh, also my my compliments must go to the interviewer because somehow he managed to to uh, to have gene and paul let their guard down a little bit at least uh Especially Gene, I felt was uh, uh, made some real cool statements, uh, and Paul as well at times. Uh, Paul actually, the thing he said about fame—I've never heard him say that before. That fame, fame, fame doesn't change you. Fame, fame, <laughs> fame allows you be to be the asshole you are. Stuff like that. Uh, so, so somehow he, he, in a way, you know, said that he had did done some, some bad things over the years and. That's about as much as he will um, backstab himself, so to speak. So, uh, and I also enjoyed some of the stuff Gene said, like when Neil Bogart called him and uh, threatened to break his legs. Mm -hmm. Never yeah. heard that before. <laughs> yeah. And and the thing you said about the guitar stuff with with the uh, Ivanes guitar there was really cool. When it kind of uh, reminded me of the stuff Paul did during the the height of the pandemic. You know, when he did the Love Gun, he talked about Love Gun and, and a few songs and just played bits and pieces. So I really enjoyed that. So uh, overall, I was really satisfied. Uh, and as Mark said, you can't get your hopes up too much at this point of time. I mean, they've done loads and loads of stuff. And what's left? Well, they managed to find some stuff that we have ha hadn't seen. So I was really pleased. <clears throat> yeah, Robert, you uh, make a valid comment about they were more honest. They they certainly yeah. came across as more sincere. Um, and even though I'm a little bit critical of the narrative and the shaping of the narrative, yeah, it, it, they came across well. The interview was fantastic, by the way. Uh, Mark, was that you who who mentioned um, allowing them to speak? Um, well, one of you did. I'm losing track. There's six people on the screen here. That's cha very very challenging. All right, Mark, take credit for it. Um, yeah, I, I said it. Yeah. Yeah. So, Ken, did it live up to the hype? Well, for me, I don't think it lived up to the hype. <laughs> um, I was going through it, and, yeah, there were some cool things in there that popped up um, that I hadn't seen before. Vintage, uh, footage like Cobo Hall footage, uh, you know, in the audience and that sort of thing. And it sounds like, wow, that, that exists. Um, and, and, you know, a number of other things. Um, but, and maybe I expect too much. I, and that's probably what it is. I expect too much. Yes, you do. I, I expect them to get it right, <laughs> uh, you know, at some point. Um, but I think it, it was an advertisement, uh, really just for the band. Um, they're not going to say anything in that documentary that's going to degrade the band itself or its, you know, legacy um, because they want the people to come to the show, buy the tickets and come to the show. Um, but it did bother me about, you know, the canned footage and stuff like that. And, uh, and, you know, we've heard on the board, someone said that they had to do with, you know, how much it costs to, to, you know, license those songs and that sort of thing. Um, but the, another problem is it was more about, not enough about the music 
itself. It was more about just the band, the makeup, and the show. Um, I wanted I wanted more about the music. I mean, I loved when they were in this. You know, Paul and Gene are in Electric Lady, and they're sitting there and they start playing. You know, uh, Let Me Know and that sort of stuff. I would have loved to have seen a lot more music or about how they come up with a song you know they did yeah rock and roll all night you know they did that and but i want a little bit more of the music uh a lot actually a lot more of the music because i'm sorry the music is the backbone i think for that rest of it to be put on the top which is the makeup and the stage and everything you can't have kiss without good music behind it it would would have never happened if the music sucked so, uh, you know, it's, uh, just to say, I, I saw some things in there. I don't know if everyone, anyone saw this or noticed it. When they were showing in the warehouse and the forklift is going and there's the pallet of, of record albums stuff, I looked at it and I looked at the number. Solo albums. Solo albums, and I saw which one it was because it was all 7121. And I looked at it and I like, oh, which one's that? It, it's all, no, it's Ace. Oh, is it Ace? Those were Aces. Uh, so it was the 7121. See, that, that's just geek stuff, of course. But, <laughs> but it's an obvious nerd. Nerds. Yeah, nerd, nerds, nerd, nerds. But, yeah nerds. I would have wanted to. Oh, it's just real life stuff. What are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> and the other little thing that bothered me is that we used, reusing the same footage over and over within the documentary, like the jeans holding the hand, you know, backstage uh, holding Peter's hand and yeah. bringing him, you know, to the stage. They showed that at least four times, I'm going to say, uh, in that documentary. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think they need to do that. They could have found something else. To put Subtle in. hint. I'm, I'm pretty sure Peter would have found the stage. You know, it's that like 10 foot the wide end. thing or in the 70, 60 foot wide thing. It, it, you know, it, he's going to find it. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you know, and, and Ken, you know, you were there in the 70s. So, you know, I, I think I appreciate your comments the most out of all of us here because you've been there since alive too, legit yeah, old school. I mean, it wasn't bad. I'm just saying it wasn't geared towards, again, like I said at the very beginning, it's not geared for the Kiss Die Hard. It's not for the fans. This was not for the fans. It was for the general casual or casual fan in public. Oh, ab absolutely. You know, it's going to be the fans who do crazy stuff like the podcast history thing that we're doing. You know, that'll be, you know, 20 hours by the time it's said and done. The band isn't going to yeah. commercially be able to do that. Uh, th there's absolutely no reason for them to either. So within the format, did it live up to the hype? Yeah, that it, it promised very little and delivered. Um, <laughs> it, it delivered new footage. But in terms of content, in, in terms of the verbal history of the band, it delivered very little. Um, to, because we're diehards, we we, mm -hmm. we think we what we we think we know it all, and what we don't know, we think doesn't matter. So, uh, for someone who is just casually sitting down to watch it, you know, I think they're going to come away with a false impression about the band's history and the importance of all the moving parts that have gone into making that band a success. But it does come back to Gene and Paul having been the ones who did keep it going. So you can never take that away from them. So hype. Yeah. You know, but you know what? Sorry. One thing that I found that was kind of interesting was something that Robert Hoffman here said. He goes, Tom Morello and Dave Grohl were great, but I would have liked to have seen and heard some peers from the seventies. I think they did that on purpose. I think they did that because, you know, they kiss like to see themselves as current and very hip. And now, so who are you going to put on the thing, the screen to make people, you know, see it that way, you know, you know, put Dave Grohl, the, the be all rock and roll guy of the, of our era now, you know, and you're gonna put Tom Morello up there, you know. If, if they if they went back and got guys from like you know the bands that they toured with before, whoever was still alive, and bring them up there to talk, you know, then they were probably fearing that oh we're gonna look like an old washed up band if we put the old guys up there. We gotta put the young current guys up there, make us look really hip for all the young people that are watching it now. I, I totally get that vibe that they were trying to make themselves look you know, very current and very, very hip and now still. So I think that's why they didn't go back to some of their peers, quote unquote, from the 70s. 
I think yeah. that says a, that says a bit about about Gene and Paul if they think Tom Morello is kind of hip and young. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, he inducted them into the Hall yeah, of Fame. We all know that, that for what that matters. So, well, there's yeah. more current than some of the guys they played with. That's for damn sure. And save so is yeah, Dave Grohl. Damn sure, but it's like 20 years. Uh, Rage Against the Machine was a big <laughs> thing. Yeah. All right. So let, let's move this move this along into the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, let's let's start with the ugly and, and work our way up the positivity chain. Um, you know, get all that negative crap. What what were some of the things that you felt were the the ugly side of this documentary, Lonnie? Um, I didn't like the revisionist history that we talked about. How Peter. Um, did not jump on board going on the Japan and Australia leg of the farewell tour in 2001. And it was revisionist history that they didn't talk about at all that Peter played on symphony, that Peter came back and did that. I thought, I thought that was handled very poorly that if, if you didn't know any better, obviously you thought, Oh, well, well, Peter's last show with them was in October of, of 2000. That, he never did anything with them in, in 03. And Peter played very well in 03 at the show I saw. So I thought I thought that was very, very, uh, that was, the uh, to me, that was the ugliest part because it was very revisionist history that how that was per portrayed was very poor. Um, as far as ugly, ugly things else go, I, you know, I, I knew that they would, go into how Ace left, and I knew how they would go into how Peter left, and I thought that was handled better than what I thought it was going to be handled. I thought the bashing of those two when they left, I thought would be worse than what it was. In all honesty, I thought it would be worse than what it was. And they gave Vinny credit, and it was kind of glossed over how Vinny um, didn't really fit into the band. I, I thought they could have gone deeper into that. They, they did give him credit. Bruce really gave him credit. Um, as being a great songwriter and, and a great talent. Um, whereas Gene and Paul really didn't have anything positive to say about Vinny. I thought that ha having at least something positive from someone of substance was good. But I, I thought that there could have been more in that, how those albums came together and how um, much of an integral part he was in that because they felt like they had a strong album. They felt like they could take the makeup off because the, because the music was that strong. So to me, those, those were the ugliest parts of me, was Peter in 03 and, and how they handled um, the, the Vinny that's in Arrow. Yeah, and Peter isn't just Symphony, for those who, who may not have caught it. No, Aerosmith. He did, he did come back for a, a full, what was it, 60 dates on the Aerosmith tour. Right. And th that was the first time I met him properly. So um, I, again, I've told that story many times. Andrew, ugly. Yeah, I'm going to echo what, what Lonnie said about skipping over those those two things. I, I thought they spent too much time in the Wicked Lester days for a band that basically did nothing. You know, I think this was the this was the documentary that spent the longest amount of time talking about Wicked Lester. And at, at one point when I was watching it for the first time, I was like, oh, come on, get on with it. I want to get to the I want to get to the glory days before, you know, that this is over. Uh, I also thought that they maybe should have when they went through part one, I thought part one maybe should have ended as the makeup came off. And that kind of would have given part two a little more time to expand on some of those things. Uh, because let's remember, you know, they really didn't touch on the hot in the shade tour, but forever was a pretty big hit for them and forever kind of propelled um, their career a little bit at that point. I mean, crazy nights really was a, the sleeper hit, especially here in America. So I think maybe at least mentioning forever as a hit, and the, the tour that, that came after there ultimately um, would have been nice. And also would have been nice to just get, you know, just some mentions of Sonic Boom and, and Monster. Um, but yeah, yeah, that those were, yeah, those were definitely my, just those missing parts that were kind of glossed over. Okay. The ugly parts, Mark. Well, okay. How do I word this? There was nothing really, I don't think, ugly on here. But, I mean, if you were watching this and weren't too familiar with the history of KISS, then, of course, the way they treated Ace and Peter on here would be viewed as the ugly part of it. I mean, especially if you go and look at how they talked about them during the reunion tour. They had that dramatic music where he said, everything was going good until, boom, 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 the, the drugs came back. And dun, 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 dun. Peter, we had, to, we had to put, you know, all this stuff on his windows and cover stuff up. And, you know, Tommy complaining how you had to do this and that. I mean... 
is it ugly? Well, to me, no, because it's the truth. And like I said before, being in bands where, you know, you have to sometimes deal with dickhead people who are on drugs as well. You know, it, it's, We're just you know, you want to get that off your chest and you want to, you know, f- show them for what they are because it was a pain in the ass and you had to suffer through it. So I understand why they, they mentioned it. But for the casual person, yeah, exactly like that Dakota guy says, the truth hurts. Yeah. So, you know, if... If I was watching it and I didn't know much of their history, I would be probably like, oh, my God, these guys, look at how badly they're talking about these people who started the band with them. But we know all about this stuff. So to me, there wasn't really too much ugly stuff in there. It's just more of the stuff that we already knew about, but they may- maybe went into a little bit more detail with it than they might have done on prior you know, documentaries. Excellent. Daniel. Sorry, so it was six guys on the show. This is like a really slow, you know, round table today. Yeah. Uh, well, I have to second Mark. I don't think there was a whole lot of, you know, real bad stuff. And Ace and Peer is kind of used as a theme through 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 the the, the movie. Uh, they need something that stands against Gene's and Paul, Gene and Paul's work ethic and business-like uh, minds so so you need that as just uh, to, to to create some sort of drama uh, but uh it doesn't really feel good when they say it over and over again i think they could have uh, you know they didn't have to do it throughout the documentary we got it after like half an hour um so uh, uh, and you mentioned they should have done this. You wanted more of that. Well, we all want stuff. We all want more, <laughs> more details, more of this, more of that. So they can't please everyone. So, so I really think they did a good job. Uh, if you're totally honest, after 77, 78, Kiss really wasn't in, in the driver's seat anymore. Uh, so uh, uh, I was surprised they gave that much time to to the 80s and even the, the current lineup when, when they decided to do like this sort of history type of documentary so i think they did a good job uh, i would like to have seen more of the you know the couch conversation with gene and paul i think that that was a, a good session where they kind of opened up a bit it almost felt like you were watching you know that hbo uh series um with gabriel Byrne. what's it called in treatment you you were almost waiting for Gabriel to 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 ask them a question, and then they would give an honest answer. <laughs> At least that's what it felt like. Uh, it felt like it felt like a, like a session with, with a psychologist or something, and they opened up. And uh, I would have liked to see more of that conversation, but maybe it, it it'll it'll um, come up some other place at, at another time. So I think they did did a good job. Yeah, the couch scenes had a lot of soul, didn't they? Uh, it counts from the couch, Paul's foot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, <clears throat> some things that kind of I thought were skewed or whatever. I mean, Paul saying that the the character makeup was the the misstep of the band it made it look like that was the problem. That that is why they lost their popularity and so on. Um, uh, to me, that, that 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 wasn't a problem. That didn't make it a difference really um they were already headed that way when they started with you know dynasty and i was made for loving you and then amassed and then into the elder so i don't think that the, doing a new character and makeup was a i mean he said it, it sounded like years and years of foundation that they built on that makeup it wasn't that many years <laughs> it hadn't been around that long um and i was fine with the the new character make it made sense as an extension of these guys have their own personality and their own makeup. That's fine. Um, taking the other guy's makeup is, uh, you know, it's kind of you're taking the other guy's identity, identity? I guess. Yeah, exactly, Mark. So, soul. Yeah, yeah, soul, <laughs> yeah. So that was one. The other thing is that I wish they would have mentioned that Ace and Peter, the part about them, I don't think I recall it, but Ace and Peter selling their shares uh to back to kiss as the you know their quarter shares each um back and and their makeup um back you know if they didn't i don't think you would have tommy and eric and 
their current makeup if they never sold their makeup or or they would have been otherwise licensing it out to kiss and making money off of the current lineup um so that's something that i think should have been mentioned um that you know they were kind of bought out um and, and you know that's their own fault or you know whoever the lawyer they chose uh wasn't too good at, on that so yeah stuff like that i mean otherwise there wasn't anything too bad it's just kind of things that i was like no that, that's not right and again it's that's the revisionist kind of thing that we we see we saw in the in a little bit of you know both parts yeah i think the ugly for me is the perpetuating of myths such as the solo albums which clearly didn't happen as a result of unhappiness after the phantom of the park right. that's bullshit We've got the contracts. We've got the copies of Circus Magazine from Thank June you. 77. That mm -hmm. is absolute shit. Shouldn't be in there. And it's shameful that it still is because it was never, uh, it may have been designed knowing what might come down the road. But I think it was more a, ba a matter of Glickman Marks wanting those advances and the advertising and the fact that Kiss were paying a manager 20% and Glickman Marks an additional percent on top that they had to keep product churning out. So that bugged the shit out of me um, mm. more than it's anything. Been an, and it's been in every documentary. <laughs> yeah, and, ever and, it, and it's provably false. And they... You know, it's so ingrained. I, I, I mean, if you tell the lie long enough, I guess they think people are going to believe it or they believe it's it. It's not a lie if you believe it. Exactly. <laughs> uh, it's the feels. Uh, the other thing is the whole narrative around the Destroyer sessions. And I was thrilled that they put Peter's quote in the audio bites of talking about trying to keep up with Ezrin's drug use. But I think they really skirted the whole issue of Ezrin's drug use both then and at the elder um, as part of this. And they focused strictly on the drug use and substance uh, abuse of both Ace and Peter. They didn't go into boot camp, and that bugs me because that's a great story. That's a documentary in itself that Gene couldn't tune his own bass and Bob blows the whistle and says, okay, campers. There was none of that in there. And that he stretched them all not just made Peter work hard, not just p pissed Ace off no end, but made Gene tune, taught them basic fundamentals as a band about music, as only a trained musician like Ezrin could. And that's part of the magic of Bob Ezrin and what he brought to that session in taking a band that only ever really tried to capture itself live and had no greater you know, plans for recording. Well, big fucking deal. You can, you, you're trying to capture yourself live and now you're in the studio trying to create a work of art. Two completely different balls of wax, right, Mark? I mean, compared to what Ezra was trying to accomplish. So those are the two ugly things. Um, you know, some people have called out the editing of the Tom Snyder interview with Ace. Oh, yeah. um, I, I don't think that's a big deal. I don't think that's particularly ugly. So I'm, I'm just going to leave it at two for um, the, the ugly parts. And, um, yeah. I'm just checking these comments. Any of you have the ability, hopefully, to uh, throw up some of these comments from people who are watching. Um, let's get into the bad. You know, that, that's the ugly. The the bad, I'm going to say it because I'm, I'm pretty sure it's going to be unanimous across the board, is the filler music and the cheap B-roll footage, with two exceptions. I didn't mind the B-roll footage for Just a Boy, the little ship bobbing on the ocean. Oh, yeah. I that's kind of funny. I was cracking up. I wanted, I wanted to hate it, but it just fit so well with that album God, that, that I thought funny. it was awesome. And the other part of the astronaut bouncing on the moon and falling over as... Uh, <laughs> You know, for, for Ace. I thought those are great. The freaking air bottled airplane crashing. I was oh, just yeah. shaking shaking my head about airplanes because I thought they really missed some good opportunities for B roll with Gene talking about when he came to America. I identify with everything Gene was saying when he said I still feel like an outsider. But I wanted to see an L Al seven oh seven landing. <laughs> You know, and then flashing up his immigration card, which I posted a couple of years ago, you know, to kind of reinforce that. Um, so that was the ugly. The, the background music. Yeah, they said someone said that it was about the, the cost of licensing. Well, why the hell did they do those re-records then? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Why? Probably, probably because what Kiss wanted to license the re-recordings 
A and E did not want to give that. Yeah, up. yeah, I'm sure there is. You know, just like Wicked Lester had. Did it have any Wicked Lester music in it? I did see Thank one cut that no. did because yes. Paul just discovered that, that reel. Yeah. That shit's not published. There's nothing on that that reel. They could have put that in, some of that in as background mm -hmm. because none of those songs have ever been heard. Put Suter please in no. the background. Please no, no, please, yeah. Please, um, I'm begging. You. God, you put a quarter in me. So, uh, Lonnie, <laughs> while we're talking about quarters, the bad. The bad. Um, the bad was the footage like, with the ship and the airplane. And airplanes crashing, I don't think that's ever in good taste, first of all. I thought that was very... <laughs> Sweet home Alabama. You know, I, I, I think airplanes crashing, I, I don't think that's, that's worked well in the last 20 years. So, oh, I, yeah, you're probably right. Bob. I kind of cringe every time I see an airplane crashing, personally. So I think that was in very poor taste. And you would think someone at A&E would say, hey... Maybe we maybe we go a different direction instead of that. It's probably probably in poor taste. And and the ship thing that was stupid too. I mean, how cheesy can you get with 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 the ship during during the elder? I mean, you mean to tell me there's no other footage we can put on to to kind of just put out there of anything while they're talking instead of a an airplane crashing or a ship out at sea? A, a drum head full of coke with a razor. <laughs> For the elder, yeah. maybe, maybe we could put maybe we could just you know put out Gene holding Paul Peter's hand one more time out there. Yeah, so we're talking about that yes. because and and, and 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 that and that to me was the other part of the bad is that we had this we saw a band that has fifty years of fifty years history. Why did we use some of the same footage over and over again? But you know we'll get into the good because there, there's plenty of good in there of of stuff that oh wow i've never seen that before oh wow that's really cool they put that out there but i, I thought some the i thought the process was what was a little bit off of what of what they used versus what they could have used if what was and then one one more bad to me was it felt to me the whole time that i was listening to the audiobook of paul stanley's i was listening to the audiobook of paul stanley's autobiography because mm -hmm. it felt like it was the whole story was very much told in the tone of Paul Stanley's book, one hundred percent. That mm -hmm. it made it really made just like Paul Stanley's book made Paul out to be the hero, where where there were disparaging things to say about Ace, about Peter, about Vinny. You know, we we didn't want to have anything bad to say about, about Bruce, and even Gene admitted admitted fault throughout it. That yeah, you know, I was you know off doing this in the eighties or. My ego was out of control. Paul Stanley never says anything detrimental about himself. And I'm not saying he needs to come on there and bash himself. But the whole documentary made Paul Stanley out to be... Or this, didn't he? Because saint. didn't he say, you know, fame allows you to be the asshole that you are? Maybe that was his moment. Maybe. Maybe. But, but to me, it, it, it felt like an audio book. He, he showed the foot. He just he let us... He, he stuck True. the foot in there. <laughs> never mind. You will never get Paul. You will never get Paul Stanley to say that uh, out loud. But I think he at least was close to giving himself some critique in this one. The first thing was that about about uh, uh, you know uh, the elder the thing. Yeah, the, the thing you mentioned that, and, and also he he talked about doing destroyer and said I I didn't know a lot, and Bob Esrin taught me. Uh, so he, he kind of got closer to, to to telling the audience that he don't, doesn't have every answer. And that's about as much as you're ever going to get out of Paul. So I think at least it, it was close to giving himself some critique. Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about Paul when we get to the good, actually. Um, Mark? <clears throat> well, I think as far as the bad for me... <clears throat> I mean, you guys talked about a lot of the things like the, you know, the ship and all those things, which are obviously, you know, bad things. But I kind of took it a different way for me personally. It's not the stuff that they had in there. I think the stuff that they didn't have in there was the thing that was bad. I mean, they 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 covered Destroyer a bit. They covered the Elder. They 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 covered the Elder a lot more than I actually thought they were going to do it because they totally, you know, disowned that record for so long. I was almost hoping that they would, they might throw in you know a couple of seconds here and there of footage of them working on some of these records. I mean, it's obvious that they were working on Destroyer, you know, 
mm-hmm. with Ezra in there, and that there was you know film footage of there. There was people taking pictures of them in the studio there. I mean, I would have loved to have seen more of that stuff shown. You know, or what about rock and roll over? That that whole recording session was pretty much glossed over too. And we know that there's they did like recorded footage of Peter doing the drums in that separate room because they had a camera on him and stuff. I mean, where is this stuff? I'd like to see some of this stuff of them working on some of these records that are so important to kiss people. You know, I I think that to me was more the bad of it than you know a ship that looked tacky or a plane crashing. I think that they had a chance now because. You know, maybe there might be another documentary, you know, years from now about Kiss again. Maybe one more. But I can't imagine it happening. I'm thinking this would be probably the last be-all, end-all big documentary about Kiss. So why wouldn't they use this chance to just kind of, you know, dig out a little bit more stuff out of their archives and show some of this stuff, you know? That, to me, was the bad. Yeah, because they don't have anything in the archives and they have to go to third parties for anything in order to make it interesting, as proven yet again um, by this documentary. Uh, who have I missed? Ken, for the bad? No, I... Are you declining? I, I'm, well, I think you guys hit everything anyway. Um, so, yeah, I, I got nothing else on it. Nothing. Daniel? I, I got nothing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, I, I have one bad, and, and that's the story arc. Um, you know, I really think it should have focused around a live Destroyer rock and roll over the live album that saved them, the Destroyer album that made them, and the yeah. rock and roll over album that had them reverting to comfort zone. You know, that that little arc there tells so much yeah. of the band's story mm-hmm. musically and in terms of their, their psychology. Mm-hmm. And I, I think someone has, has mentioned something about Paul. Um, and, and this is going to be the start of the good section. And I'm going to give Paul props for talking a lot about his ear. Because I guess unless you have a disability of some description, that you can never really understand the effect that that disability and interacting in the real world has on a person. And he really stressed it pretty well. He also stressed his personal um situation he didn't talk about his unhappy family life and his sister that like he does in face the music but he did say you know that i'm that i was a overweight kid called stanley burt eisen and when i i saw the beatles or whichever band it was i decided that i could do that and he did with one ear you know a deaf in one side so I, I think in terms of the good in this, I'm going to give definitely Paul a shitload of respect for wearing that that proudly. I, I would like him to talk a little bit more about the family dynamic and how that's affected him as well as the disability. And Gene also touched on it as, you know, a foreigner coming to this country and being an outsider. So, you know, th- those are two very good things. Daniel, straight back to you for some of the good stuff. Well, there, there's a lot of good stuff, but I, but I have to give it to Gene. Uh, I think it was pretty fun in this one. Uh, he did a pretty good Ace impression at times. And uh, mm, uh, also, when you watch the early stuff, they had a lot of great footage from the 70s. Uh, it just became clear once again that Gene Simmons must be one of the coolest characters ever in hard rock and heavy metal history, you know, in the 70s. It's so cool to go back. And also, I like the footage of the fans, maybe because it's quite some time since since we all were at a concert. Uh, it feels even better to watch, you know, that 70s concert, uh, the fans going crazy um, with the makeup and laughing and having a fun time. So I think that was really cool to see. And uh, I just have to say that Gene, I can't imagine how it was back in, you know, like 77, watching Gene live on stage, being 12 years old, old or something. It must have been some sort of trip back in the day. So I've, if you have never seen or watched a concert with, with Kiss and you see this documentary, you sure as hell will will be um, impressed by the early Gene. Um, so, But cool. if you hadn't, what concert would you go and watch if you had never seen a concert before? Would you suggest that oh. you would go and watch The Greatest Show on Earth? 
That's available <laughs> on YouTube and Vimeo right now. <laughs> Where's the band? You got that one in. That's what. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what that is. I'm not. I'm sure what you <laughs> referring to. Never. I've never heard of it. Heard but, it. Uh, I'm sure it's good. It's fine. Uh, it's so so, so uh, obviously, so, obviously, that comment, including the word infomercial, triggered Andrew. <laughs> yeah, but but another another good thing is uh, I like the quality of some of the footage. For example, the interview they did with I don't remember what the name of the show was, but it was with uh, Vinny and Eric. Uh, I've never seen it in that good quality. Yeah, you might find Yeah, and uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, the the s snippet from Tokyo '95, just those five seconds. I viewed that a few times already. I would like to see the whole concert in that quality. Hopefully, it'll pop up somewhere. Uh, and some small details. I, I loved some of the photos they included. For example, one when Paul talked about his um, tough times in, in the 70s. And, and they, they put a photo in there where Paul looked real tired in the background. <laughs> yeah. And then in the front, you could see, uh, you know, the Paul Stanley makeup uh, performing on television. I think that was a kind of a cool thing to include. So, so there's loads of stuff. But what about the rest of you guys? Lonnie? Uh, there was, a, you know, there was a lot of good stuff in there. I personally, and, and from a, I enjoyed the the Keishi Kite Festival from a from a personal standpoint, being from my hometown, that you know, that's such a cool part of. Not only is it a cool part of Kiss's history, but it's a cool part of my hometown that they played here um, that early on and in front of such a large audience. That you know, and and it's funny. It's just like you know, like the other day was the 25th anniversary of Kiss playing Tiger Stadium. As many people as I know that claim they're at Tiger Stadium. You know, they would have to fill three Tiger Stadiums or more. And people that always claim that they're at that show. And it's the same thing around here that I run into anyone who is, who, you know, would have been a teenager or, or older in 74. Everybody claims that they were at Forest Park for the, for the KC Kite Show. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I have no way of disproving that. But everybody says, everybody I talk to that's an older Kiss fan, oh, yeah, I was at that. Yeah, I was at that. I, I've been a fan since the beginning. I saw him at the Kite Fest. I'm like, yeah, okay. I'm sure you did. So, to, but but it's but it's a cool part of the history and like the radio station KC still exists today and they you know they pride themselves in that the KC put out like a book several years ago of the history of KC ninety five and you know there's several pictures of of that footage in the book and you know KC's really proud of that and Kiss played in St Louis and were pretty popular in St Louis very early on after that after that show so um, for me that was the highlight just because it really hit home and. You know, I like seeing the, you know, we've seen it, but I did like seeing the eye video in there as cheesy as it is. I thought it was, it was cool that they included shit like that in there. Andrew doesn't agree, but that's fine. Teach their own. I, I did enjoy that too. I, I thought that was, that was cool. And, and just, just, the, and the, and the alive, and, and they touched on it earlier that footage of, of that banner on the back of the alive album cover that we saw that. And, like, yeah. and it was like two seconds. And that was my one leap out of my chair moment during during night one. I was like, like holy shit, is that what I just saw? And my wife was just like sitting next to me just on her phone, can't be less interested in what I'm watching. Um, and she's like, I, I don't I don't even know what you're talking about right now, you know. So but, but those those were those, those little nuggets like that, the little minutiae that was built in there for the diehard fans is what was great about the documentary to me was it geared toward the casual fan absolutely people at my work are like we're like texting me sunday afternoon oh there's a kiss documentary on tonight blah, blah. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> really yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then i come in the work on monday and like and and they're like well it was actually really good i was you know really interested in it blah blah blah, blah. and i'm like just reassure me it it's geared toward the person that's like either a casual kiss fan or not a kiss fan at all but those little nuggets of minutia like the Keishi kite festival um Peter without the makeup, um, rehearsing Beth, little things like that just made the documentary. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I agree with everything you guys said. Um, the, the, I think the key thing here is we got something, we got something new from Kiss. <laughs> um, we we got a another biography that was you know was provided to us. Um, at least you know in in length pretty good was almost three hours or I don't know, two and a half to three hours. Um, and 
you know, we don't get a lot of that. And yeah, we did find some new little cool things in, in the videos um, and uh, some comments that we haven't heard before and things like that. So all those things are really good. I'm glad that they were able to do it or A&E did it. Um, we're still waiting for the definitive thing. I think, I think to really get a definitive one would have, you'd have to have a, Andrew. a kid. A kids fan, exactly. A kids <laughs> fan in charge. I mean, maybe Andrew could piece them all um, together from the, all the different documentaries and make a a, a definitive out of that. Um, what, the the history fan edit. The history fan edit, right? You get from all different sources that they've had in the past, and and you know, put something together. Um, because yeah, some of the other ones have been pretty good too. You know, the one on VH1 and, and so on. You know, it has some cool stuff in it. So. Anyway, I, you know, it's good. I'm, I'm just glad we got something um, that wasn't, you know, horrible. It, it, it was good. You know, it was, it was good. Kept my attention. There's some cool things in it. But, but yeah, I, I knew most of it. Of course, we, we knew most of it. Right, but we hadn't seen a lot of that footage, and that is probably the best part of this. Yeah. You know, Calderon, 75, yeah. Waterbury never looked better. You know, Gene's mm. head catching on fire, to me <laughs> at, at least, because I've still got yeah. one of the, the original clip. I think it's in Windows Media format from Donkey's years ago when that first surfaced. Yeah. So that that looked fantastic. The Brotherhood, uh, 1968, Peter's uh, pre, pre-Kiss mm. band was very very cool i knew that was i knew that existed and to finally get to see some of it i was i thought that was absolutely thrilling there was some great creatures footage um there was uh staffordshire 1980 there was no palladium uh lydia's airplane videos you know were very cool um yeah. so again this is a band that has often said that people listen with their eyes and that if nothing else kind of resonates to me with this documentary that it's almost better to put it on mute and just watch the eye candy rolling by and go oh uh, or or ooh, wait they, ah, they ooh, ooh, or they they replace the pic the photographs of the four members on the mtv unmasking from yeah. the uh the studio photo session that had been done and uh me. yeah to the uh for, to the dynasty stuff but uh, and various errors for for Vinny, obviously so that was kind of interesting but it was all about video rather than content for me and that really is the best part of this documentary turn off the lie channel and listen, you know, just watch the pictures. Uh, Mark, did I get, get you on no. the good? Okay, no. well, please, please do. Uh, well, I mean, a lot of it was touched on. I think for me, the main thing that was the good was, like you said, the video stuff. I mean, all the things that we never get to see that they popped up. I mean, the one thing that I thought that was really interesting, although it was like a microsecond, like two seconds, was when they showed that video of Shandy when they turned around when they were in their outfits and they let it go a little bit further than it is in the actual video and you see how they're just standing there and then they kind of just separate and walk away like that that whole kind of like thing at the end of that was kind of interesting to see that it's just those little kind of things that you weren't expecting that they did put in that I thought was pretty cool to see uh, but I mean other than that I think that was really the best parts of it i mean all the other things you know they were good like i said it's, it's, it's not a bad documentary you know but like everybody was saying before this is definitely geared for the casual fan and i mean because they, they did gloss over a lot of stuff too like they never mentioned about how close to bankruptcy these guys were at one point they never mentioned you know paul stanley's psychiatrist that almost screwed things up completely for the band they never mentioned a lot of things but like we said they're not going to make the band look like idiots in this thing that that's one thing they didn't want to do so of course they glossed over all those parts right but there's a lot of parts of history that were left out in this too but what they did put in were really good in the the the, the video footage that we never got to see before that's in there is really really good yeah did i miss anyone on the good all right let's move on then and oh andrew you missed me Oh. oh my God! Yeah, Andrew, <laughs> how could we miss you? Oh, how how could how could that happen? Man, um, I'll keep it short and sweet because uh, a lot of the good uh, that I thought everybody already said, 
Uh, but my favorite part was that little black and white clip of Peter getting ready to sing Beth. It looked like that was from the uh, already circulating to, uh, Rock and Roll rehearsals. Reading, I Wednesday. was there last week. Went to the base. Reading, yeah, yeah, it's cool. So, um, so stuff like that. Like I love seeing stuff like that. But again, there were so many little cool nuggets uh, for us to see. I like seeing little extended clips from all those whole movies that they shot for the Second Coming. <clears throat> You know, seeing them putting the makeup on again for the first time, like that stuff yeah. was cool. I'd watch two hours of just that. So, um, but yeah, there was a lot. There was a lot of great stuff, a lot of cool stuff to unpack, a lot of good. All right, I'm sorry, I missed you. All right, let's move on into one of the other categories. If anyone has to drop out, do feel free. If not, stay as long as you can because we're going to keep this going. We're not going to do a a review longer than the uh, actual freaking movie or a documentary like uh like i'm sure some will but um what are some of the voices that you think should have been heard that were missing in action i think we we've already popped it up on the screen uh from one of the people who are, who are watching and bob kulik is probably one of the biggest ones i did do a list uh while i was watching the screen i'm like there's no ck lens there's no carry there's no one from the crew um there's no djs there's no well, who's still alive from the original crew Moose, oh. Rick, uh, Moose, uh, yeah, I have no idea. I think so, Moose, yeah. yeah, Moose definitely is. I emailed him last week. So, um, Lydia, yeah, thank you. Um, Joyce, what about is Joyce? And Joyce, uh, Joyce, Joyce was Bogart. the original co-manager along, and and I can understand that she doesn't always want to be in the limelight with some of the things that she does, but it was very. Um, kind of single point uh well single focus you had bob you had bob ezra making making mark twitch um eddie kramer bruce um eric and tommy uh, and that's another one of the goods actually because i thought they were fantastic recounting them their fandom in 1974. Right. so th those were good voices but a lot of missing voices but again you do have uh like someone mentioned carrie did record stuff but it wasn't used so you know you have time limitations um ken who do you think is the most important missing voice or voices uh in to your way of thinking uh yeah. well i mean you, you just mentioned some of them, you know chris lent and and like i said uh bogart um and who uh lydia chris i think Definitely, because she was there. She was there with Peter, at least that Peter side story. I mean, if you're not going to get Peter there, why not have Lydia Chris? Uh, what, totally insult him? God. Yeah, yeah, she could insult him too. But um, no, this, you know, speaking about what was going on there, I'm sure she had, she was, she has all, you know, her book with all those photos and everything else. Um, she, she was there when they were forming uh, and then through the, some of those tough years, first few years. So, and then when they hit it, so I think she would have had a lot of interesting, uh, you know, stories and, and tidbits that would have been cool for mm -hmm. us to hear. Daniel, how about you? Who would you have loved to have heard from? Well, from, from what I've heard, uh, the memory isn't what it, supposed to be with some of the guys you mentioned for example michael james jackson seems to have a hard time remember stuff from when he produced the band and so on but uh I, i'd like to see as mark mentioned at, at early in the show uh, artists maybe alice cooper uh, people that influenced kiss alice cooper um, i don't know if any of the guys in the new york dolls are left but uh david so, johnson yeah so 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 guys like that i mean i missed that a bit so so if you could add not a whole lot one or two uh here and there just to to hear their their take on the story and uh have them talking about seeing kids grow and uh, following them from from day one so so i guess that's what i'm i'm missing but you don't you can't use too many i think it's better to have uh, persons talk a few times and just have them you know pop up once and then you never see them again in, in, in the documentary so it's always you know <laughs> you have to have a balance but um, alice cooper mm -hmm. yeah that, that's that would be a very good one or maybe even some of the other bands that were playing the coventry scene at the same time kiss word or the daisy or, or, or whatever um is it lou lynette or wasn't he still alive yeah, yeah. though what about uh what about um 
Sid, the owner of Coventry. Go ahead. No. Yeah, there, there's a good one. Even though they did mention Bill Starkey, mm-hmm. you know, uh, mm-hmm. and Jay, Jay Evans was the other original founder. You, you, know, you know who else they should have talked to? They should have talked to, like, some of the engineer people, like Corky or Dave Whitman, those guys who were involved with the recording of the records. Like, what about, like, Kerner and Weiss, like the guys who were there at the beginning who did the, you what know, the that? first... Okay, well, I mean, just audio of something. Do they have, do you have interviews with them? I mean... Mm-hmm. Look at uh, what's his name there? Mitch Lafon interviewed interviewed them. So there's there's audio of them, obviously, and they did talk about Kiss. I'm sure if they really tried hard, they could have got something. But you know, it's Kiss, so of course they didn't. They should have interviewed Kiss's first webmaster. What's his name again? The name just escapes. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't remember. Something I'd like to see him. Eddie Trunk. Yeah, Paul's Eddie favorite. Trunk. <laughs> they just they just used audio for Eddie's uh, show. They yeah, they did that. And Mark, yeah, so- the pro- well, I was just gonna say, Mark. The problem is they're not gonna talk with those extra producers and these, which would have been nice, and the engineers because this was more about the the show and the makeup and their sure. the chemistry. And not about the music. It, it really wasn't <laughs> yeah. about the, the music. The, the thing Unfor- that, yeah. Unfortunately, yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah, I, I don't think we need any janitors whatsoever. There, there's already enough shit going there, around. Hey, no, they're not. They're not janitors. They're masters of the custodial arts. There, there, there you go. That's a nice. Uh, what the hell's that movie? You, you from this bowl cleaners. <laughs> Imagine. Sorry, every, Sanders watching the show today. Yeah, every, every, everyone chimed in on there who they think is missing. Mm-hmm. So let's move um, on then. What? What? Who was? Um, hold on. There was. Um, Sorry, come on. Get what about? Uh, what about the manager? Uh, come on, Andrew Black. Paul's Paul's psych psychiatrist manager. Yeah, <laughs> he's still on Good the run. Luck. Good luck finding that guy. What about what about <laughs> someone that? Him. What about like someone involved with Phantom of the Park? I know Anthony Zerbi has nothing to say, nothing nice to say about it, but maybe it would have been cool to have him just have his head in his hands <laughs> or something like that. I don't know. Mm. Yeah, but Thank you, Robert Dunning. Breakfast Club. That is, of course, the custodial arts is like where that comes yes. from. So, is Andrew old enough to remember that? That's yes, I'm old enough to remember that. I'm almost forty <laughs> years old. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's move on into uh, one of my last questions, and then we'll cover anything that you guys think I missed. And that's the standout takeaways, photos, footage, or comments um, that are, are going to be the ones that resonate with you the most from the history documentary. Let's start with you, Daniel. Well, I think we've talked a bit about it, but I have to um, talk once again. Tokyo 95 is, of course, uh, right. there when I really, really yeah. was a huge fan of the band. They were everything to me. Uh, so anything from uh, early 90s and just prior to the reunion era, which I think my, Andrew got a kick out of the, the, the reunion stuff. Uh, I, I only got those few seconds from 95. They didn't show a whole lot of live footage from, from anything else, but uh, that was real cool to see in that type of quality. Uh, so I've reviewed that Daniel, over and over again. Daniel, yeah. did you notice the huge jump in quality for the convention footage when Peter came up the same? Yes. Mm-hmm. We've yeah, seen yeah. it before, and it was always like really dark and murky. And this was mm-hmm. a huge, it's, it was clearly yeah. the same source, but just a yeah, huge, uh, huge upgrade. Yeah, so someone did a whole lot of work on the on on the or stuff. Maybe and, not. Uh, maybe they, they finally found those, they those tapes. Yeah, no, maybe they, they have them. The original. Yeah, they, they, but, they've got but, them. But one one more thing about I think they talked a whole lot about the convention tour, and uh, they said a lot of positive things about it. I, I don't think I've heard them talk that positive about the convention tour. It felt like a necessary evil back in the day. They couldn't tour anymore, and they were almost forced to do this. But both Gene and Paul talked about it very fondly, and uh, they said they had a fun and good time, and it was real cool. So I think that was kind of fun to see, to see, especially after reading some of Paul's books where he says that they didn't even speak to each other back in 94, Gene and Paul. So um, I guess they got over that and, and the convention tour was, was a start of them reconnecting once again, maybe. Yeah, but you know what's cool about that too that I thought was actually interesting is that knowing how Paul is, 
I actually thought it was very cool that he left in that part of him doing Hotter Than Hell where he was screwing it up on the acoustic and he's like, I'll get it, I'll get it. Like, I actually thought that was cool that he left that in to show a yeah. little bit of, you know, yeah. that he's anybody not know, always Anybody perfect. know what city that was from? No idea. Do you have the answer or was it legit? No, question? Not, yeah, no. I, was, I was thinking that you were going to say, you know what show it's from? It's from, you know. Yeah, I, I I don't remember what. Uh, but Mark, you talking about the the guitar stuff? So the section in Electric Lady when they mm -hmm. do the little jam of Sunday Driver and then go yeah. into the into the studio version. I love that. Mm -hmm. I also love Paul playing My Uncle Is a Raff better than Gene. You know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, Gene's still the clunking Rocky around on it, and uh, yeah. you know Paul just gets there with his you know with his Paul um, mm -hmm. panache. Uh, yeah. It is is very cool, Lonnie. Did I, I go to you yet? No, um, but I, I think we've covered a lot of the a lot of the standout stuff when we talked about the good. But to me, and we, I would the 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 sit down interview with Gene and Paul and and Paul's feet, you know, on <laughs> on his uh, Paul's feet yeah. on his furniture. It's his own furniture. I guess he can do what he wants, but. It's to not me, now. I was thinking of the people who bought the furniture when <laughs> they were showing it. It's his, now he, his, it's his now. he put his feet on. Yeah. But to me, it, that was more. It was more of a just the more most honest. I think I've really seen. There's the two of them talking, and I, I would love to see more of the outtakes of that. It's just the two of them having a having just an, an open conversation about the history of the band. Um, to me, that was that was really really. Not really, really honest. I thought just the two of them talking back, back and forth. But and we, we know, and we've heard the, the story before. Like, well, we couldn't have had Kiss without Ace and Peter, but we couldn't have a Kiss today with Ace and Peter. You know, mm -hmm. and we're really lucky to have Eric and Tommy and, and, and Gene. Just like, well, absolutely. Like, like, why are you even bringing that up? Like, absolutely, we're so lucky to have Eric and Tommy in the band today. But you guys have it. Have we ever seen an interview with them doing this type of stuff together? I'm not sure. I've mm -hmm. seen them no, reminiscing it's, together. It was sort of a Separate, great yeah. dynamic, and they a small thing, small small stuff that we didn't know about uh, came up. Like talk about Gene's. Uh, he was scared of flying, and and Paul mentioned he fell asleep after the Creatures show because it was. You know, stressed he was, out, yeah. yeah, stressed out, and and he he, he also reminisces about uh, you know playing the shows on the Creatures tour and pointing towards oh yeah, empty nobody. seats, yeah. nobody yeah. over there, people over there, yeah, over there. Yeah. Yeah. Over over there. there. So I think that by doing this together, they kind of pull stuff out from each other that they wouldn't normally say. So I would like to see more interviews with them like this together. Great, yeah. I thought that. By was the way, I love your shirt, Daniel. Yeah. You know, Daniel, I it was I think it was several episodes. Oh, that episode. is cool. That's a cool shirt. Mm -hmm. Several episodes ago, where uh, we were talking about what we would like to see in this, and I, I did mention. I said I would have liked to have them. Well, at that time, I said all four of them, meaning the original four, in in a round table kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and, Ken, and you're such an optimist, Ken. I mean, yeah, there's, there's, there's no way that will happen. <laughs> Look how good it was with just Gene and yeah. Paul. I mean, yeah, yeah, I I, mean I, I one guy saying something gets a reaction from the other yeah, person, and then, the, yeah. then then something else triggers, you know. And but they won't do that with them. Man, it would have been, I would have been awesome. Been amazing. I'm, I'm yeah. with you. But it'll never you know? happen. So Dan, Dan, you'll raise something great about that Tokyo 95. I, that will be, or hopefully would be, a fantastic from the soundboard release, if not oh, only, yeah. you know, oh, audio, the video. But to hear that show as good as, you know, the 2001 show um, sounds, I was listening to that again today, you know, it would just be spectacular. All right. I, I think I went around everyone on that, but I do want to finish uh, or start wrapping up with a um, kind of final question. Are Ace and Peter's voice truly missed on history, or were they sufficiently well filled in from the archival clips when you consider everything that goes along with Kiss being, you know, Paul's creature, basically, uh, but, you know, owned by Gene and Paul or, or whatever the case is? I'll start off on that. And um, I, I don't think they're missed. I think their voices with current footage of them being interviewed would have been really nice. 
but I do understand that business gets in the way of that. And obviously the deals being offered weren't sufficient for them to want to be involved. And it was also very clear from the use of their clips that it was very cherry picked to, to support the narrative of the story. So I understand why they didn't want interviews being cut up without having editorial control over how those clips were then integrated into the storyline. That's completely fair. But, um, you know, in, in terms of a standalone product, someone and a lot of people have mentioned it on the thread, the chat thread going on this. This isn't for us. This is for people who don't know anything about the band. So I don't think they're even going to notice or pay attention to the date stamps on those audio clips from Ace and Peter, which in some ways is unfortunate because it would be great to get, you know, updated points of view on history, just like we got from Chief and Paul. Mark. Yeah, I mean, I don't think they're really missed. I mean, if you if you put if you were to put them on there, that's one thing I was thinking about. If you were to have gotten them on there, I, I think it would have been like stuff that they probably wouldn't have let them put on the documentary anyways. I could just imagine if they asked some questions to Peter or to Ace, and they answered honestly how they feel right now. Really, do you think Paul and them would have allowed those comments to be heard on this? I don't think so. I think that they just took comments that you know were relevant with the time period that they had you know and when the band members were still kind of in decent standing with the band and they used it that way i think it was smart on their part because if they actually let them say what they were thinking at this time i don't think it would have been very good in terms of making the band look good at all you know they would have been complaining about all kinds of stuff i mean you know the just from stuff that I've heard before, you know, Peter complaining about Ace getting more money on the reunion tour or the farewell tour or whatever it was and stuff like that. Like, I mean, they, they could have went on and on for it with stuff that they were complaining about. But this way, at least, they had them in there. They had some audio clips that were useful for the time periods that they were talking about. And it just helped with the whole narrative of the documentary. So I think that they weren't really missed. Wow, Mark. That was deep. Um, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, before I answer, I just kind of want to throw a quick question out to everyone. Does, does anybody know where the interview that they use of Peter was from? There was, knows? there was a couple different Peter it, audio. Yeah, there was one archival one, I think, that wasn't there from Second Coming. That's correct. So there, they basically, and they almost doubled up on using some of the things that were actually in the Second Coming that okay. they used from Peter. Um, but as big of a Peter and, and Ace fan as I am, this isn't even the first thing that they've been absent from. If you remember the old VH1 Beyond the Makeup from 2001, Peter was out at that point and Peter wasn't even in that one, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, let's fast forward on years later when they did the Kiss Alive one for the Ultimate Albums VH1 show. Ace wasn't in that one except for archival footage. <laughs> so this isn't the first time where, where those two guys have had to have the, the holes filled in. Um, but remember, too, the Kistory book was the Gene and Paul story. So it just so happens that the Kistory movie kind of follows the same, you know, the same formula that the book followed. So would I like to have had them in there? Absolutely. But I don't think they I don't think they were missed because they were represented uh, in one form or another. Yeah, awful lot of footage of both of them and all those mm -hmm. ones of Peter Smiley behind the kit. They get me yeah. every time. Lonnie. You know, I think I think they were missed to a certain extent. I, I mean, I, I think it was good that they had the archival interv interview footage with, you know, with them. But it would have been really nice to see their face and see them talk um, present day about what happened in the 70s and what happened in the 90s. I, I, I think that I think that was missed. I think it would have been it would have been really no. Hey, would you get them all in the same room and, and Ken's? Fantasy world? No, probably not. But I think it would have been great to to see their face and see them tell the story. Now, Mark's also one hundred percent right that, and and this is why. And at the end of the day, I think more than money is why it didn't happen. Is that I don't think it was worth Ace and Peter's time to do it because they could sit down and they could do these interviews and they could tell their side of the story. Or they could tell just what happened, not even their side of the story. Just just talk about the seventies and talk about the nineties, but. At the end of the day, they weren't going to have editing privileges, and if we didn't like what they said at this point, at this part, well, that's not going to make the documentary. But we're going to take this little segment that you said that I did like, and I'm going to put that in there. 
and I'll put this in there. But this, well, I'm not going to tell the story of you saying negative things about Gene or negative things about Paul. I'm not going to put that. That's not going to make the final cut. So to to their point, like, why why bother to go do this? Because I'm not going to have editorial controls. But were they were they missed? Yeah, I I, I would have really enjoyed to. Well, now we shoot to a. a camera of ace sitting in his home present day here's peter sitting in his home present day i think that would have really enhanced the experience of the documentary but i understand at the same time why they didn't do it yeah good good points daniel yeah uh, i'd have to agree with robert hoffman he, he wrote that that they did a good job representing ace and peter given the circumstances yeah I, i'm almost almost a, a bit afraid as to what they would say uh, they might mm -hmm. actually do themselves uh, a disservice in interviews and say stuff that might not be correct or would sound kind of bitter and stuff like that uh, and that wouldn't add a whole lot to the documentary i think they picked pretty good uh, uh, interviews that represented the views we've heard from mason peter um so were they missed? Yeah, if you could do Ken's fantasy world once again, that would be awesome. <laughs> but just having them one by one, I don't think they would add that much. Unfortunately, I don't think they would add a new perspective. Certainly not Ace. I mean, Ace would how just much be does... like Ace would just be like at at this juncture. I I don't see this. I, I don't see it happening no, at this juncture. I, 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 I don't think it, it so, so on yeah. and so forth. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so on and so forth. Uh, so so uh, I think they did a good job, and uh, unless we get Ken's fantasy world, I'm not sure we'll we'll you know get a whole lot out, out of them. Dreamer. In the next podcast episode, we're going to Ken's fantasy world, a new <laughs> show <laughs> featuring Ken. Uh, all right, Ken. So, we're, we're down is up, enough is down. I'd watch yeah. that. I'd watch that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I agree with you guys. Um, yeah, it would have been nice to uh, have them um, show them now how they are now. Um, it would be, you know, I started thinking, you know, they should have had something even at the end of the uh, documentary where it shows, you know, kind of, a, you know, how they do, where, where are they now kind of thing, mm -hmm. almost. Um, and they could have mentioned that, you know, Ace's sobriety, years of sobriety, and yeah. Peter too. Yeah. I mean, you leave you leave that thinking that these guys are just still probably alcoholics yeah. and drug addicts. It's a good you point. Know? Good point. I think it's a, it would be something that you know at least show that you know they recover. Oh, that, that's good. That you know he's he's on the right track now and all that. Um, and even they even Kiss themselves could have had you know and Kiss continues you know, kick off their, you know, final leg of their end of the road tour advertisement, right? Um, and then, you know, what Bruce Kulik is now, you know, playing guitar for, Grand, you know, Grand Funk Railroad. Or, and so or show even, yeah, show Peter Chris's final show that Julian went to, you know, that one. Yeah, exactly. That they could have done things like that. Yeah, show um, Peter's happily retired. Living those, home, are, you know? yeah, hmm. those are things that are missing, and I think they should have definitely done. That, that's a fantastic point. Where are they now? That that would that is that's a real missed opportunity for this actually. Mm -hmm. So, do you guys have anything that you, you want to add on that? Yeah. You know, yeah, I have a question. I have a question, and this kind of just goes for everyone. <laughs> Did you like it better than the previous documentaries? Mm, well, no. I, I think my favorite documentary that I think I've seen is the Second Coming. I, I mean, because I kind of like those kind of, you know. I, what I loved about that was the whole bit about them, you know, getting good back together at Gene's place, showing them getting the, the makeup back on, and then the whole thing where they went to the uh, Grammys, like that whole bit leading up to the tour, and then showing the tour and all the little inside things behind the scenes stuff. You know, that's the kind of one that I really liked. I mean, you know, extreme close up, I think would be me maybe closer to what this is supposed to be, but this is more detailed. I think a fa my favorite one is Second Coming, but I think as far as a telling the story of their whole career, this one is probably the best one. Mm. Very good point. But, but I'd say timeline is really important because uh, uh, by Second Coming, it was a bit too late for me uh, when Extreme Close-Up came up, even though it's not really deep or anything. 
I love that one. And in that one, you have those short snippets from, mm. I think it's the UK show mm. shows they did. Just small, small. And I started, you know, you had a VHS, try to pause in order to see <laughs> what the hell happened. And the, the, the screen went like this, and it was hard to see. So I remember <laughs> that very vividly and fondly. So I'd have to go with Extreme Close Up, maybe because it came in 92. It's, I'm not sure it's the best one, but for me, it's always mm -hmm. special. Yes, yeah, it's, it's the one in your narrative, just like I, I probably would have said, you know, Kiss Exposed, because that was my mm -hmm. first kind of documentary mm -hmm. uh, about the band. And it was at that formative period in my fandom, you know, Extreme Close Up came later. Uh, but, you know, Second Coming is a really good one to kind of focus in on because of the positivity of it overall and, and just the high focus for it. Lonnie. Yeah. Um second coming to, I, I love i love extreme close-up because of the fact that when i bought that i learned so much about the band as a 12 13 year old kid i learned that's where a lot of the history of and my knowledge of the band stems from is from watching that the first time and i learned so much history of that but second coming to me is my favorite because it's so positive and it ends on such a positive note that they're they're back to it's like it's like a fairy tale watching the second coming that they ends on such a positive note and then they pull off this worldwide tour and they're the biggest band in the world again um through, you know and it, and it does go through you know the history at the beginning talks about how they broke up and came back together i love second coming when i would i would watch the second coming for years if i felt down i'd watch the second coming because it made me feel so much better about life that gene and paul and ace and peter figured it out and and look at them now so so things aren't as bad in my world because look, look at this. I would always watch the second coming because it would always make me feel better. So I second coming still wins for me. Ken? Yeah, you know, I, I like a little bit of all of them. They all have their good moments. And what I really want is that six hour, which, you know, David Donnelly uh, mentioned the six hour um, Ellen Parker one. Uh, I wish that would get leaked um, so we could take a look at it. But yeah, it's not likely. We'll probably be dead before it's, it's leaked. <laughs> which, which is a real shame, really, because uh, what I've heard about it is that it's very interesting. All right. Anyone else got a question you want to throw into the mix before we uh, call this one quits? Andrew? Is there anything that you'd like to say? Because I, I know you've been watching these comments about, uh, you know, the, about how fans make the best documentaries. How much did you pay that person? Hey, Alexander, you, you missed the show. Um, I don't even know who that Patty is, but. Uh, but you agree. Well, yeah. But, uh. <laughs> All right, so let me just wrap up through some of these these comments. So uh, Alex liked it. Alex, wish you'd been able to join us tonight, but then again with six and the challenge I've had uh, herding cats today is, it is a real challenge. So I guess we want to know from everyone who is watching this, you know, all those questions that we've kind of asked amongst ourselves, you know, what were the good, the bad, and ugly parts of it for you? What were your standout parts? What were your least favorite parts, you know? And was it worth the hype? So th there was a whole bunch of ways of looking at this. But you know what? I think it comes back to in 2021, KISS does a documentary over two nights, over an hour of commercials and three, hour three hours of documentary. And they actually forget to really pimp the end of the road. <laughs> you know? True, it's, true. It's, they actually forget to yeah, any merchandise good. or any add-ons or meet and greets <laughs> or anything. They completely miss the opportunity cool. to tell people that tickets are on sale to the tour and to come out and you know. Yeah, where and, was the tour commercial? Like, why yeah, wasn't that? Where, where was the commercial? Um, but it also, I think, it should have ended the very end, just like the "Kiss My Ass" CD tray inlay. You know. Yeah. A nice little thing like that would have been very cool. So that's our review of it. We've, we've skipped over some stuff, and no doubt we'll talk about more in the future because there's an awful lot to digest. I know people are going by through this frame by frame, trying to identify all the footage, all the photos, you know, and, and all the new stuff versus the old stuff versus the change stuff. So it's going to be something that is a gift that keeps on giving. It, you can go to Amazon and iTunes and purchase it to watch 
Um, and obviously, you know, for those who are not in the in the United States, um, you know, who knows what will happen in terms of broadcast rights in those markets, and a, maybe even a full length sure, uh, full length Blu-ray release. Who knows? So there we go. That's it for now. So from Julian, from Daniel, from Ken, from Mark, from Andrew, and Lonnie, and Alex, who could have been here, you know, thanks for joining us with this live broadcast, and uh, tune in next time. See Take care. Bye-bye.